Hello everyone and welcome to today's REVIVE webinar by the Global Antibiotic Research and Development Partnership, GARD-P. I am Laura Piddock and I will be hosting and moderating this webinar on testing for the potential of emergence of antimicrobial resistance. Two years ago, GARD-P launched the Education and Outreach Programme, REVIVE. REVIVE aims to connect and support the antimicrobial research and development community by facilitating learning, sharing knowledge and connecting people. These webinars are part of our educational activities. All webinars are recorded in full and can be viewed after the live broadcast at any time on our website revive.gardp.org forward slash webinars. I encourage you all to visit the Revive website to stay up to date with details about future webinars, watch recordings of previous webinars and to find out other information about our other activities such as our blog on antimicrobial resistance related topics. Today's presentation was also part of the boot camp, understanding the potential for antimicrobial resistance in the drug discovery process, which we co-organized together with Carbex, the Repair Impact Fund, the JPI AMR, and Welcome Trust at the 2019 ASM ESCMID Conference on Drug Development to meet the challenge of antimicrobial resistance. You can also watch the recordings of our other co-organized conference sessions and boot camps on Revive. As usual, today's presentation will be followed by a question and answer session. You can submit your questions at any time during the webinar via the questions window in your webinar control panel as shown here on the slide. We will ask these questions after the presentation and do our best to respond to as many as possible in the time we have remaining. Any questions that we do not have time for, we will do our best to answer by email at a later date. Today's speaker is Dr. Michael Murray, head of the bacteriomics platform at Evotech. After an early training as an engineer, Dr. Murray obtained a PhD in bacteriology in 1998 at the Institut Pasteur in Paris. He then completed postdoctoral training at Harvard Medical School in Boston. His research is in the fields of gram-negative bacterial envelope physiology and bacterial pathogenesis. In 2003, he became an assistant and then tenured professor at the University of Montreal in Canada. While there, he developed a research program on pathogenic E. coli at the School of Veterinary Medicine. Michael received a Canada Research Chair Award for his work on bacterial animal diseases and numerous other grants and awards. In 2011, he joined Sanofi to work in the discovery platform of the Infectious Diseases Therapeutic Area and then to Evotech when Sanofi transferred its infectious diseases portfolio. Michael is located in Lyon where he is in charge of Evotech's portfolio of research programs and the technology platforms addressing severe bacterial infections, including drug resistance. Welcome, Michael. Please, would you begin your webinar? Thank you very much, Laura, for this very kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here and to share with you uh, a few of my views on testing for the potential of emergence of antimicrobial resistance. So these are uh, my views. They do not represent necessarily the views of Evotech. And my goal here is to share some of the sometimes painful lessons that I've had to uh, go through during the course of various programs whilst at Sanofi and in Evotech now. 
So really why uh, we need to, to capture uh, a global view of resistance is uh, shown here in this slide. I think today we need to concentrate a lot on finding uh, new solutions to fight antimicrobial resistance and that goes with uh, sometimes the implementation of novel phenotypic screens or find novel ways to break uh, the gram-negative permeability barrier. And because these are new mode of actions, it's becoming vital to evaluate, understand and manage the risk of resistance that are associated with these complex and unknown mode of actions. That's why I propose to uh, present to you uh, various, uh, various parts, various sections. First, a part on measuring resistance. Then I will uh, try to go over how to understand resistance. In a third part, I will try to explain to you a few of the steps that you can undertake to go from in vitro to in vivo. And then I will close up with a discussion. So as a first part, I will go over how to measure resistance. And here, the goal is really how easy to determine how easy it is to select for resistant mutant. Ideally, you want to get numerical values, which can help assess the magnitude of the risk for resistance emerging in clinical setting. Why would you do that? Well, a quick answer is just to say, because you have to. And at the bottom of the slide, you can see that this is guidance from the EMA that clearly states that uh, sponsors need to uh, assess this risk of resistance through exposing strains of species relevant to the indications at concentrations below, at or above the MIC. So how does that translate? The two most common tests that are used in uh, traditional programs to test for resistance, uh, to measure resistance, is the spontaneous frequency of resistance test and the resistance by serial passage. But first, you can already have a flavor for the problem resistance might uh, pose to your compound by just performing uh, MIC 90s and evaluating cross resistance. On this slide, you see on the left part here, uh, MIC, uh, MIC 90s represented uh, as a distribution. And you can see in one case that compound one has a very tight distribution, whereas compound two has a very broad distribution. The broad distribution is already telling you that in the clinical population of strains, there are some strains that have a high MIC. And so this should immediately tell you that there might be a problem of resistance pre-existing in the clinical population. To go one step further, you can quickly uh, look, perform correlation studies using the same data set to see if your compound is actually uh, uh, the resistance or uh, uh, the MICs of your compound are correlated with the MICs of known compounds. So, for instance, here you can see that uh, your compound MIC is correlated, correlated with the MIC of cyprofloxacin, which suggests that you have the same targets and at least the same liabilities uh, as cyprofloxacin. And here, another case where your compound MIC is not correlated with imipenem, and so here you have no cross resistance. So this is really a first step that is easy to take, and usually you have this information very early on in the project. But really the gold standard is the frequency of spontaneous resistance experiment, the, uh, the four study. This is a very simple, simple design that is supported by guidance, and that consists in uh, pouring plates that uh, contain your compound and then plating on these plates uh, uh, an amount of a colony forming unit of clinical strains, of strains, of bacterial strains, usually 10 to the 9 to 10 to the 10 CFUs, and then wait for a period of incubation, usually 24 to 48 hours, and then count the, the, the clones that grow. By putting an amount of compound that is above the MIC in the plate, you will, by definition, select for resistant clones. And by making the ratio between the number of resistant clones with the input, you have a frequency of resistance. So as you can see, this is a very simple design, but there are several points of attention. First, this is, uh, you have to determine the uh, MIC in the plate, in agar, and be, uh, be aware that sometimes this agar MIC 
is different from the broth MIC. So the first step you have to do is to determine this agar MIC and use that to then uh, play it at multiple uh, multiples of the MIC. You have to use at least 10 to the 9 CFU per plate and use usually perform uh, the assay with 5 to 10 plates. And as you can uh, then gather, you require a lot of compound because you've, you have typically 30 milliliters of, um, of volume in an agar plate. You have also to perform a test with several species and if possible several strains per species because genetics matter a lot in this uh, in the resistance so uh, you have to really try to vary the, the genetic context and you also have to use known compounds as comparators typically the plating is done on plates that uh, contain several multiples of the MICs twice four times eight times or ten times the MIC sometimes more and two very important points that I'm going to elaborate on is that you need to check the stability of the resistant clone and characterize the resistant clones. Checking the stability is really essential and consists in, in once that the, the resistant clones appear to passage the, the clones on plates that do not have the compound. So the pressure, the selection pressure is absent in those plates. Typically, you perform three replicates, sometimes more. And after the last replicate, you repeat the challenge by putting the clones, either determining an MIC or putting the clones um, on, sorry about that, putting the clones on the plates with the initial uh, amount of compound. That number then will give you, you will see that some of the uh, initially selected clones might disappear as shown here with the arrows. And so you have to adjust the frequency of resistance that you determined before to this new frequency of resistance that gives you a more accurate number. To illustrate that, I took an example from the literature published in 2014, where you can see about 40 clones that have been selected uh, uh, for their resistance to either rifampicin, canamycin, or nalidixic acid. And after the selection, these clones are passaged once, twice, or uh, three times. And at each time, the liquid MIC is determined. As you can see, the clones that have been selected uh, for their resistance to rifampicin have, whole, have all very high MICs. And this is the concentration here used for the selection. So the stability of the clones is really perfect. Here for canamycin, the concentration selected for selection was that one. And you can see that for many, many clones, you can, you lose, uh, the clones lose uh, their, their, their resistance after, uh, even after the first passage, sometimes even after the first passage, and most of them after the second and third passage. Only a few clones remain uh, resistant to the level that have been used for resistance selection. And here with dynodixic acid, you have an intermediate uh, situation where some clones are stable and many clones uh, do, uh, and some clones actually lose uh, their, um, uh, the, the, the resistance after a few passages. So this is absolutely essential to have a better picture of uh, the, 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 the frequency of resistance. Then, uh, once you've checked the stability of these clones, you can go, go uh, go along and characterize the resistant clone. Typically, you have to evaluate the MIC shifts. So you've selected, let's say you've selected at four times the MIC, it's important to determine by how much the MIC has actually been uh, increased. It could be eightfold, tenfold, hundredfold. So this is important. Then for the clones, sometimes not all the clones, but at least a few selected clones, you have to evaluate the cross resistance. Have you selected for resistance to uh, other compounds in addition to your own compound? Lastly, it's important to try to evaluate in vitro fitness. The clones you've selected might be uh, poorly poorly fit and have, uh, be at a disadvantage, in which case the situation might be uh, less, uh, less dire than what you would think. So what do you do with the uh, frequency of resistance results? It's a simple design, but what does it mean? In fact, nobody clearly knows what a good frequency of resistance is because there is no established translation to the clinic. So you have to really ask uh, a number of questions. 
are your frequency of resistance in general below 10 to the 9? Usually people think this is, a, this is good. If your frequency of resistance is around 10 to minus 8, that's when people start to, uh, to be divided, whether it is acceptable or not. And unanimously, people think that if your frequency of resistance is uh, above at or above 10 minus 7, this is considered to be bad. There are huge variation. It's normal. Do not average the frequencies. Just re uh, report the, uh, the range of frequencies that you have observed when you repeated the experiments. Do not compare with compounds that are on the market because usually they, they often have a, a bad frequency of resistance. So because your compound is better uh, than, uh, than rifampicin doesn't mean that your compound will be a better compound than rifampicin. Because you've performed the stability test, it's important to evaluate if this initial resistance uh, selection leads to stable clones. If the clones are unstable, maybe once the pressure is off, the compound will revert to, uh, to sensitivity. Are the MIC shifts low? In which case, maybe increasing the concentration of compound might alleviate the issue. Are the frequencies going down with plating on increasing for the MICs? So this is a, going in the same direction. This would, uh, would suggest, if you observe something like that, this would suggest that by adding more compound, you can alleviate the problem. Are the mutants cross-resistant? If the mutants are cross-resistant to a number of compounds, this, is a, this might become, a, you might have a bigger issue because you're not only uh, selecting for resistance against your compound, but again, other compounds that might uh, be used for, for salvage therapy. So this is a bad situation. And are the mutants fit? If the mutants have a def, uh, default in fitness, uh, this might mitigate the issue that you've uh, uncovered. There are other ways to, uh, to measure the frequency of resistance because this is a simple design, but actually in the 40s, uh, uh, Luria and Delbrick uh, were trying to see, to, uh, to check between two models, the induced mutation model and the spontaneous mutation model. And they came up with a mathematical model to address this issue that is actually a, a much more rigorous model to evaluate the mutation rate that will lead to resistance. I will, not, I will not go into the details, but just to say that it hinges on the fact that when dividing, when bacteria are dividing, if a resistant mutation appears very early in the genesis of the final population, then you will have more clones that are phenotypically resistant compared to a situation where the resistant uh, mutation appears late in the, uh, the growth of the, the population. So this again, uh, and this is something that uh, Luria and Delbrick observed and they concluded uh, that the spontaneous mutation model that we take now for granted was the valid one. So this also explain why uh, you might have sometimes very big differences between the frequency of resistance in your experiment. Uh, because if you repeat the experiment over and over again, you might have, you might uh, be unlucky and be in a situation where the resistant mutation appeared very early in your, uh, in your, um, the culture that you used for the selection. But again, the point here is just to say that there are more rigorous ways to test for this mutation rate, but there are mathematically difficult uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, perf uh, to perform, they are uh, biologically and mat mathematically difficult to perform, so they are usually not done. Another standard way to, uh, to look for, to measure resistance is to do the serial passage experiment. Basically, uh, the principle is to, do, to perform a standard MIC, in, uh, usually in a micro tighter plate, and uh, to determine the MIC, the minimum concentration where there is no growth. And then the experiment goes on to, uh, to take the, the well just before at uh, half the MIC, sometimes a quarter of the MIC. It's best to use the last well where there is um, uh, at least no obvious impact on growth. And use that well to seed another culture to perform another uh, MIC. This experiment is uh, repeated for 14 to 28 days typically, and at each passage, you, uh, the experiment gives you uh, the MIC. And so this is translated in a, graphic, uh, in a graph like this one, from which you can infer uh, the, the, the passage day 
uh, where there was a significant shift in MIC and by how much. As you can see, it's very easy with most antibiotic, antibiotics to select for a very high level of resistance. Several points of attention. It's an easy test uh, because it's basically repeating MICs over and over again, and it does not require a lot of compound. Still, it's important to perform the test multiple times because the trajectories, uh, this, this graph here, can vary widely. Again, as before, it's important to test, uh, to do the test with several species because uh, the genetics, uh, the genetic background is important. And it's important also to use known comparator, uh, known compounds as comparators. But don't just try to be better than the comparators because, again, they are usually very bad. It's important to freeze the cultures at several time points in order to be able to analyze the resistant clones. And here, for the, uh, the analysis of the resistant clone, you can refer to what I've said before for the frequency of resistant uh, design. There are alternative ways uh, to, uh, to look uh, at uh, resistance appearance and to generate resistant mutant. And here I'm only showing one very elegant work uh, performed in the laboratory of uh, Dr. Roy Kishoni in Harvard. Uh, that is called the mega plate experiment. It's uh, it's basically what it's uh, what I just said. It's a big plate, 1.2 meter over uh, 60 centimeters, with a gradients, a step uh, gradients uh, of the of uh, an antibiotic compared to the MIC. And uh, then there is a video capture that looks at the dynamic of the population crossing. Uh, going across the barrier of an MIC uh, of a shift in concentration and from that you can uh, by using the proper tracking device actually access uh, the whole phylogeny of the evolution of resistance. This is very elegant as I said uh, but obviously it takes a lot of compound and you get information such as the time to an MIC shift that is not obvious then to translate into an actual risk. So what to do with passage experiment uh, results? It's actually uh, difficult to, uh, it's important because it corresponds to a clinical situation where uh, the bacteria in an infection uh, foci might be exposed to uh, concentrations of compound that are below the MIC. This is uh, something that uh, can occur and usually do occur in the clinic. So it's, it's intuitively uh, relevant to the clinical situation, but what does it mean? And in fact, there is no established translation to the clinic. So a few, again, a few key questions to consider. How high can you get in terms of uh, increase of MIC? And how fast do you get there? This is, these are the two, uh, consideration, two points to consider. It's important, if you can, to characterize the clones that you select and to see how different they are from the clones that you selected from the frequency of resistance, the spontaneous uh, frequency of resistance experiment. And it's important also to compare yourself to the compounds that are known to behave well or poorly in this assay. So as a final slide for this slide, I will show the pros and cons of the various experiments, uh, design, experimental designs that I've shown, uh, frequency of resistance, fluctuation tests, serial passages, and others. And I will not go into any details. I will let you uh, try to capture, uh, capture the, the slide. But the main question is, should you do frequency of resistance and serial passage experiments? My personal take on this is that you absolutely should, because those are two very different ways to select for uh, genetic events leading to uh, an increase in the MIC. And again, they correspond to uh, various situations in the clinical setting. The spontaneous frequency of resistance is the risk that you have to select under intense pressure usually when uh, the compound is administered to a patient initially, whereas the serial passage uh, gives you a flavor for the risk uh, of selecting for resistant mutant through the initial selection of uh, compensatory mutation when compounds are below the MIC. And also, uh, as an added uh, value of doing these two experiments, is uh, when you understand the genetics that are uh, behind uh, these events, it might uh, give you also more information on the mode of action of your compound. Which leaves me to the, to the second part uh, of, the, of uh, my presentation today, is to try to understand the resistance. In fact, this question 
is uh, what does it mean to have a high uh, MIC? And by trying to address this question, you can identify the targets and other gene products uh, that can affect the compound activity. So it's, an, it's, a, it's a way to try to uh, uh, have a better grasp on the mode of action of your compound and rationalize the risk of uncountering un un resistance in the clinical setting. Again, why should you do it? Well, because again, the, uh, the regulatory agencies, such as here the EMA, is just asking you to. So mechanism of resistance should be investigated. Unfortunately, there is no simple answer to address that question. And so the best and the most uh, uh, practiced way to, uh, to tackle the question is to use several approaches to characterize the resistance strains. And there are several ways to do, the, to do that. Uh, the easiest is to check uh, influx and efflux because they are classical mechanism uh, for uh, increase in MIC. If you know the target, check the target to see if there are uh, variations, allele variations in the target. And if the target is unknown, you can try to perform whole genome sequencing of the resistant clones or mutants. Uh, but I will get, uh, I will tell you that this is uh, usually uh, difficult to um, uh, to conclude from that. Or first do a uh, try to do a characterization of the mode of action, and then go back to check target and influx and efflux. Checking influx and efflux is easy. The point is to use isogenic series of strains with influx, such as uh, membrane biosynthesis uh, defects or porine uh, mutants, or if defect in efflux, such as pumps mutants. So you use these isogenic strains and you measure MICs. So this is illustrated here with uh, three strains, a wild type E. coli, a, a E. coli deleted for an efflux pump, and a an E. coli deleted for uh, a gene that is involved in the biosynthesis of heptose and resulting in a truncated LPS. You see that this compound, uh, X1, has no issues, has the same MIC, roughly the same MIC in the three context. So there is no influx or efflux liability. But for the second compound, there is clearly a reduced MIC when efflux is knocked out. So this tells you that your compound has a, has a efflux liability. And the third compound here is not affected by efflux, but is a, the MIC is strongly diminished when permeability is increased. So here there's an influx problem for your, for your compound. A few points of caution. Most of these mutants are pleiotropic, and so it can cause confusion, meaning that you're not only sabotaging the efflux, but sometimes you have broad impact on the physiology of the bacteria. Most pumps are also redundant, for instance, in, especially in some species, such as Pseudomonas. And so here to have a clear view, you need to perform multiple mutations in the same context. So again, the genetic context matters a lot. So if possible, uh, have the isogenic series of strains in various genetic contexts. However, you select, you identify resistant clones, be it by the spontaneous frequency of resistance experiment, or because when you perform the MIC 90s, you identified high MIC clones. The next step that you can take is to sequence the um, these mutants. It's worth doing that only when you have stable clones. The direct, and from these clones, you can directly sequence the putative targets and transporters. It's the preferred option for clinical strains. If the mutants have been obtained from clones that are selected in vitro or in vivo, as you will see later, the whole genome sequence is the best way because there, there is no bias. You look at everything uh, possible that uh, uh, triggered the resistance. Two words of caution, mutations uh, affecting target and transporter can also be a mutation that change the expression level or the copy number. So sometimes there is no mutations in the coding part of your gene, but mutations in the promoter part. A strong word of caution is that performing whole genome sequences of clinical strain, such as uh, the strains that you identify in an MIC90 uh, like here, is usually useless unless in, if you want to, to find something new. So if you want to look at something beyond uh, 
um, a target that you know or the transporter that you know exists. Unless you perform a full genome-wide association study, because here, uh, observing a mutation in a putative target transporter gene in a clinical strain does not guarantee causality. And a full genome-wide association study is really uh, quite complex. Genome-wide association study look usually uh, like this. This is an example where uh, a compound was actually a, a virulence factor inhibitor. And comparing the impact of the compound on a panel of pseudomonas strain, a small panel of pseudomonas clinical strain, you could observe, we could observe that some strains were very receptive to the compound and some were resistant. Because it's a virulence approach, we knew what the target was, and so we sequenced, uh, we got whole genome sequence of, the, uh, of these clinical strains, and we focused on the target-rated genes. And from this study, you could see uh, that there was a clustering of the uh, sequences with, of the strains that were uh, resistant to, your, to our compound, to this compound, and a clustering of the sequences of the target gene for the strains that were sensitive. And this clustering was very different from the clustering from housekeeping gene. And so this suggests, but it doesn't prove, uh, that there was a selection of these uh, target-rated genes causing the, causing the resistance. But again, it's not a proof, and a, f uh, a better study would have been a full uh, genome-wide association study. This slide just to illustrate uh, a situation where by performing whole genome sequence, you, uh, you identify regions of the chromosome where you have increased read number. So that tells you that there's an amplification of gene X, in that case twofold, and in that case eightfold. It's important then to check that what you saw by the sequencing translates uh, in actual copy number increase by qPCR and increase level, increased levels of expression by QRT-PCR. The more classical situation is when you identify missense mutation in a gene X. So those are single nucleotide polymorphisms, polymorphism, polymorphism, sorry, or SNPs. As I said, you can also have mutation that increase the level of expression of a gene uh, or decrease, for that matter, by insertion outside of the gene. And this is the case where uh, a, a mutation an event was identified where there was an insertion sequence in the promoter of this gene, providing a very strong promoter and increasing the level of expression as shown here. So there's interpreting uh, the, uh, the whole genome sequence of mutants that have been selected is actually more tricky than it might seem at first glance. There is another way to uh, look at the whole genome uh, at, uh, in an unbiased way, and it's a global approach using transposon sequencing. Transposon sequencing is the use of a very dense library of, uh, of transposon mutants, and uh, challenging these, uh, these libraries, uh, for instance, no antibiotic, and challenge them in parallel with antibiotic, and to see, to identify through next-gen sequencing, what are the, uh, the transposon mutants that disappear in the, under the test condition. And this tells you, uh, this identifies genes that are important uh, for the resistance to antibiotic, because when knocked out, uh, they, they disappeared from the population, so they were more sensitive to the compound. This is an example of a result from a transposon sequencing uh, experiment performed with uh, a compound at one time the MIC where you, uh, you can identify uh, genes that have reduced fitness, and it's uh, actually in interesting to see that there are efflux uh, pump uh, mutants. On the other side, you see mutants that have increased fitness, and here it's, it was interesting to see uh, a gene called SBMA that is actually an inner membrane transporter. By using uh, defined mutants, so in efflux or in the transporter, we could confirm uh, the, these, uh, these type of um, uh, these, ty these results, the deletion in the efflux was uh, reducing, uh, making the strains more sensitive, and the deletion in the importer was actually uh, increasing the MIC. So, in a one single step, you can have uh, an, uh, a view, a global view of your efflux and influx liabilities, and sometimes also uh, the, the pathways, the target pathways that are involved. And this can be used actually to test, it's, it's interesting because you can then follow uh, a medicinal chemistry program. So 
this is uh, an actual the actual results uh, of uh, the transposon mutants uh, uh, in three different genetic regions around the SBMA gene that I just uh, talked about and around the tall C flux uh, pump. These are the, this is the trace of the transposon mutants in the untreated sample and when treated with the native molecule, as I shown before, the SBMA mutants are selected because the compound does not get into the bacteria and the tall C mutants are counter selected because they, uh, there is less, uh, they are less able to resist the compound reflux. So here, through medicinal chemistry, there was an optimized molecule, and you see the success of the optimization because the SBMA uh, mutants then behave just like the untreated sample almost, and the tall C mutant behave just like the untreated uh, sample. So through optimization, we, we solved the issue of influx and efflux. And when you look uh, elsewhere in the genome, here at a CDRO4 uptake system, you can guess what was done in the medicinal chemistry program, adding a CDRO4. So again, this is a very powerful technique that gives you a very global uh, picture of, uh, of all the, um, uh, of how um, uh, you might uh, modify the, the MIC towards your compound. So what to do with all uh, results, uh, be it from, uh, from uh, sequencing or from uh, checking uh, selected mutants? There are, again, a few key questions to consider. Understanding resistance is usually very, either very simple, uh, you have a mutation on the target, mutation in the pump, or mutation in an influx system, or it's very, very, very hard, because you oftentimes identify mutations in regulators or in compensatory pathway, and those are very complex to interpret. So, in essence, what I'm trying to say is that you never get the full picture, and there is rarely a translation to the clinic. Only some mutations are known to occur in the clinic, and intellectual arguments are usually dangerous. So, for instance, predicting that uh, reduced resistance uh, will uh, uh, reduce in vivo fitness based on what you think you know about the pathway that is altered is usually dangerous. So, to finish this part, uh, again, the pros and cons of the various experiments I've alluded to. Uh, we're trying to look at uh, directly at target and influx and efflux uh, system is, uh, is really easy, but it's not comprehensive. The whole genome uh, sequence of selected resistant mutants, so again, I would not advise to do that uh, on directly on clinical strains. It's much more comprehensive, it's, nowadays it's very easy, but it's going to be hard to interpret. Characterize the MOR, of course, the mode of action, of course, would be ideal because, again, there is no in vitro bias for recent selection. But from there, uh, first off, there is no casual approach. And from there, trying to, to guess what are the resistance issues that you might encounter is, I just said, a guessing game. I would like to say that for me, the whole genome sequence of selected resistant mutants is a must. And you should do that even at early stage. Uh, and uh, even at the early stage of your, the characterization of your mode of action, because it, it gives you also ideas uh, on how, on the mode of action of your compound. The resistance of uh, clinical strains, uh, and trying to understand why some clinical strains might have IMIC is usually done at a later stage. Switching gear now, I will uh, quickly uh, give you a few, uh, a few uh, ideas on how to move from in vitro to in vivo. Here, the goal is to, to use several approaches to test whether the risk that you identified in in vitro test can translate or not in, uh, uh, in in vivo models and in a clinical setting. So it, it, it's based on the interpretation of uh, the numbers that you've generated before, the mutation that you observed, uh, but also trying to, under, to get resistance in in vivo model. And then, uh, one, one key experiment is to try to test the impact of uh, varying the regimen of administration uh, to mimic the in vivo regimen of to mimic the in vivo regimen of administration, uh, because usually in the experiments that I've alluded to before, the compounds are given at a static concentration, whereas in vivo, of course, there are fluctuation in this concentration. Usually, this is done at a very late stage. If you have to do this very early on, usually it's a bad sign. Thank <laughs> you. 
what I would strongly encourage you to do is to try to identify recent mutants in vivo, because there is no, even though there is no uh, proven translatability uh, to that approach, it's intuitively much more translatable because uh, you do that in an animal, in an infection setting with varying concentration of compound. The trick is to use a high inoculum size in, a, in an animal, but the problem is that usually the inoculum size is much smaller. You'd, so you, you should try to go as high as you can, typically 10 to the 8 CFU, and for that, uh, to administer such a huge burden, you usually have to resort to a thigh model of infection. You can use um, uh, you can use this in high inoculum and try to double plate, so plate on non-selective and uh, selective plates, and try to, uh, to count the number of resistant and total colonies, and that gives you an idea of what, what happened. So this is an example here of the experiment uh, that was uh, uh, geared at uh, uh, looking at the, uh, the impact of uh, using a, sim a similar dose, a similar total dose that is uh, uh, color coded. So blue, blue, uh, green, and green are the same total dose, but in on this side administered once, whereas on this side administered six times over the course of a day. So when you perform this experiment, you see the total number of, of colonies, which is the traditional way of doing this type of experiment. You see differences, but you don't really understand what happened. When you do the plating and you measure the amount of resistant clone, you see that by, uh, by fractionating the dose, in, this, uh, in these cases, in the red case and the green case, you actually increase the number of resistant uh, mutant. Whereas at very high doses, the fractionation actually improved a tiny bit uh, the, the number, the total number of, uh, of resistant mutant uh, that you uh, that you were able to select. So you see, it's an interesting experiment because first it confirms that you can select uh, a resistant clone uh, during a, in an actual infection and during an actual treatment, and it also uh, allows you to. Uh, to test directly what vary, varying the uh, regimen of administration might do to these uh, selection events. So building on that, there are other ways to find or at least to have an appreciation for how changing the dose or the regimen might prevent resistance. The easiest is the, called the mutant prevention, mutant prevention concentration or MPC. It's a simple idea is to, to plate the number of CFU that is your target frequency of resistance and then plate on increasing uh, concentration of compound until you have no growth anymore. So in this in instance, 32 times the MIC is your mutant prevention concentration. If an MPC is low, then you're obviously in a better situation even if the frequency of resistance is high. Performing time kill, time kill curve experiment and looking at rebounds, ensuring that the rebound is due to the appearance of a resistant subpopulation is also very powerful and is another way uh, more kinetic to look at mutant prevention concentration. More and more now, uh, uh, there is a way to mimic uh, various regimen of administration using hollow fiber models. Bear in mind that those models are actually long and complicated uh, even though the uh, advantage is that they can directly mimic human PK. So you can explore, and you can explore much more parameters than in animal experiments, so they are very valuable. Lastly, um, you might consider to, do, to perform combination studies. So, uh, because in the clinical setting, it might be a strategy to combine your compound with another uh, antibiotic and aim for synergy in order to, uh, or to protect uh, uh, from a resistance appearance. So this is again a very elegant, uh, I'm, I'm here showing a very elegant study from again Roy Kishoni's lab in Harvard uh, to, uh, to look, uh, which was, it was a study to look at antibiotic interaction that select against resistance. While these studies, uh, I strongly encourage to do uh, checkerboard assays in, uh, in uh, in your, in your programs that will give you a flavor for this type of, uh, of results. Uh, uh, basing your, your, your clinical strategy on uh, using a combination of compounds that would select against resistance is to my knowledge unheard of, so you should be very cautious. I will finish by uh, uh, trying to uh, wrap up uh, uh, and to summarize what I just said during, uh, during uh, 
this, uh, this webinar. Uh, first, a common question, points and limits. Um, many times I said that there's a lot of viability in these experiments. They are due to the experimental design, but they are also due to the genetic background. And here, uh, this is illustrated here, where you see a frequency of resistance performed in a wild type, and this was a, a study published in, uh, in uh, Science. Uh, where you see that the frequency of resistance is very different in a wild type situation uh, compared to a situation uh, where uh, uh, efflux pumps are mutated. So genetic context is very important. So uh, uh, it's a difficulty how you choose your your strains and your species will have of course a, a huge impact on how you do uh, on the results you get. It's difficult to sample, so which species to test, obviously the ones that are important for your target product profiles, uh, but uh, how many strains for, for each species should you choose and which one to choose? This is a very difficult question. The experiments I've alluded to, I've alluded to uh, only giving you a partial answer because there are other ways to, uh, to have uh, uh, to, uh, to have a resistance. It's uh, uh, indeed we are showing only for the selection of genetic mutants in uh, in the experiments I've uh, presented before. We uh, none of these experiments are geared at looking at persistence and tolerance risk, which is uh, as uh, shown here a situation where you kill a lot of sensitive bacteria, but you are left with persistent bacteria that might come uh, that are not genetically modified, but then might uh, regrow once the pressure. Uh, is uh, as abated and so the infection comes again. So performing this type of assay is not routine and so it's uh, if, it, if it becomes important uh, uh, you should consider it but usually it's considered only at late stage. And again none of the experiments have uh, shown a test for horizontal evolution risk or uh, the possibility to, to acquire uh, genes in the environment that will give you uh, resistance to your compound. Of course, the most important limit of uh, everything that I have uh, said is that uh, the numbers and the information that you get is usually very hard to translate. Eventually, I'm leaving you with uh, a single question, and uh, I'm sorry that I cannot bring uh, give to you uh, uh, the answer to that to, to that question. It's what is a good result for recent studies. Um, and the intuition would say that uh, the, uh, the relative resistant level, for instance, this is only a two-dimension, two the relative resistant, mutant, uh, resistant level of a mutant compared to its fitness, if the fitness is very high and, uh, and you can, if a mutant is very fit and uh, gives a very high resistance, uh, then you, there is a high risk compared to a situation where the resistance level is relatively low and the fitness on top of that is low, you would think that you're in a, in a, in a situation where it's low risk. But th this is not really clear cut. And uh, uh, here uh, on this side, you see um, uh, the results of clinical experience showing you that depending on the sp spontaneous frequency of resistance uh, numbers that you can observe, does not uh, correlate well with the time to acquire resistance in the clinic. So again, um, it's very difficult to, uh, to, to, to uh, in a nutshell, say what is the good result from, from these recent studies. So the take-home messages, for me at least, are the following. Uh, resistance is one of the most common reasons for stopping a project, so you have to take the time to investigate it with approaches that are appropriate to the stage of your project. There are many options and many different kinds of information, so take time to plan and do not just use frequency, spontaneous frequency of resistance experiment uh, with one strain. Putting the information together is often very complex, but if you see a problem in vitro, be very, very cautious when you argue that it should not happen in vivo. Many people have tried to, to do this argument, and it's it's usually uh, it's usually very uh, very then very late in the game that you uh, uh, then you realize that you were wrong. Arguing that it's not really a problem because you have the same results with comparators is also not a good way to go because usually these comparators are bad and you want to replace those. Rescuing a resistance issue. Uh, by medicinal chemistry is usually difficult, but if you identify mutations 
on the target or susceptibility to efflux, this is usually a problem that can be addressed. It's not guaranteed, but it's worth trying. Overcoming an influx liability uh, is usually more complicated, and if you get off-pathway, off-target uh, mutations that uh, brings you a high level of resistance, it's usually very, very difficult to overcome. So it's a lot of efforts, and yet we still don't know much about the translation of all these studies. And we don't, as I said before, we don't know what is a good or a bad resistant preclinical profile. And with that a bit sobering uh, uh, statement, I will uh, stop there and take any questions. Thank you, Michael, for sharing your experiences with us and the audience. We will now start the question and answer session. As a quick reminder to the audience, please send your questions via the questions window on your webinar control panel and we will do our best to respond to as many as we can. So we've already received quite a few questions, so I will start. Michael, when performing spontaneous frequency of resistance studies, you said that a lot of compound is required. In your experience, how much is typically required? Um, thank you for, for the question. Uh, this is uh, indeed something you have to consider because it impacts the number of compounds that you can test and how early you can test them. Uh, there is no single answer to that question. It typically depends on the MIC of your compound. Obviously, if you have low MIC, then you will need less compound to go twice, four times, and ten times the MIC. Remember that you have to determine the uh, agar MIC and then do the challenge. And so um, uh, you, need a, you need a lot of plates. But usually, typically, uh, for MICs that are around one uh, microgram per mL, you can you will need something like two milligram of your compound. And if you need if the MIC of a compound is 10 microgram per mL, then it becomes really a lot of compound, and you will need 10 to 20 milligram of compound to do the experiment. Thank you. A somewhat related question is, should um, antibiotic exposure always start at four times the MIC? What are your thoughts on selecting mutants at the MIC or even concentrations below the MIC? That's an interesting uh, question again, thank you. Um, so it's true that um, uh, usually we start uh, the, uh, these selections uh, at concentrations that are above and sometimes significantly above uh, the, uh, the MIC. The reason behind that is that uh, usually uh, very small uh, and unstable changes uh, can, uh, can result in, uh, in uh, the variation of the, uh, of the MIC. And this is also, you have to take into consideration the fact that the MIC determination itself is uh, usually uh, admitted to be uh, varying with a, a twofold value. So meaning that if you have an MIC of one, if you repeat the experiment, it's normal to have an MIC of 0.5 or of two. So that's why, I mean, usually people like to start, uh, do not do the experiments at one, at just the MIC, and usually go uh, significantly above, and usually four times uh, above the MIC or twice the MIC, because again, this is the variation that you have in MIC determination. Now, uh, selecting uh, with uh, concentration that are below the MIC is equivalent to doing the passage experiments that I explained. Thank you. Another related question. In checking selection for spontaneous frequency of resistance, why would you use antibiotic concentrations of eight times or ten times the MIC in an agar plate? Because would not the colonies growing on those agar plates also grow on two times or four times the MIC? Yes, um, that, that's right. And usually, uh, so as, as I said, we usually you perform the experiments at two times, four times, eight times, and ten times. You do all concentration. You don't choose just one. Uh, the reason behind that is that um, uh, this gives you an information. Uh, and usually this frequency of resistance will vary 
with the uh, the amount and that tells you uh, that if you put a lot of compound you can mitigate uh, the uh, the issue of uh, selecting for resistant mutant um, so it's, a, it's an important information to have. On the contrary, if you have always the same frequ frequency, that means that a single step, uh, because in spontaneous frequency of resistance, you, uh, you make the assumption that uh, there is a single step, a single mutation that gave you the resistance. So if the resistance is constant, that gives you, that tells you that uh, a single step allowed you to select for a relatively high uh, level of resistance, and this is usually bad. So uh, again, it's the it's a, it's it's not very complicated to do, and it's it gives you a, a lot of information that is valuable uh, later later on because it will have an impact on how you uh, decide to dose uh, your your compound. Thank you. Changing uh, site now, we have a few questions now about fitness of resistant mutants, and the first question is. Is there a classical test to evaluate the fitness of the selected resistant mutants, whether you've selected them in vitro or in vivo? Yes, that's a, that's a very important question. Unfortunately, the answer is no. Not At least not that I know of. There is no classical way to look at the fitness. What people would usually do is to uh, perform first uh, just a standard growth curve and see if the, uh, the replication rate is altered in the resistant mutant. If you want to go one step further, it it's, could be worth uh, doing uh, competitivity, uh, calculating a competitivity index. So that means that you mix wild type and mutant one to one and you perform the growth of the two together and you see if the mutant uh, is uh, overwhelmed by the wild type or, or, the, or conversely. So that is all done in vitro and you can do the same experiments uh, in vivo. So testing the resistant mutant in vivo and to look if there is a change in the virulence of your, of your, um, of your resistant mutant. I personally, I prefer to do a competitivity uh, experiment in vivo, so mixing wild type and mutant one to one, putting that into the animal and see if the mutant is uh, overwhelmed by the by the wild type. To do the experiments, unfortunately, you need to have a marker for your mutant, which is not uh, which is not uh, obvious. So it's it's a it's a bit more work. Thank you uh, for that comprehensive answer. Following on from that. Um, why do you recommend a competition rather than uh, an experiment with just the resistant mutant? Uh, yeah, that's again a very good, uh, very good question. Uh, I would say that a lot of people in vivo do, uh, when they go in vivo, do just the resistant mutant alone. And that is mainly because uh, to do the competition, you need a marker associated with uh, the resistant mutant and that can be difficult uh, but still i like the mixing of the two population because it's uh, in my mind at least intuitively it represents uh, more the uh, the clinical situation that is a situation where you have a complex population with some mutation that might arise and then will have to be selected in the context of, of the treatment. So in the presence of otherwise wild type uh, parent. So to, in my mind, at least intuitively, it represents better the, the situation that you will encounter in an actual uh, uh, scenario. The experiment that you said, uh, so testing for the resistant mutant alone, is more similar to, um, to, to, uh, to testing a high MIC uh, strain traditionally. So doing the, an in vivo experiment with a high MIC strain. So meaning if there is clinical uh, uh, resistance that already exists, is, uh, will your compound be able to, to, cap, to uh, cure the infection? Presumably not, but you have to test that. Thank you. So just a point of clarification on the next question. When you mean, sorry, when you describe a fitness test, you mean you should measure the growth of the bacterium in either the test tube or in an animal? Correct. Thank you. Okay, um, moving on then, there's a, a GWAS question now. 
How many clinical isolates are required to perform genome-wide association studies of resistance? Yes, so this is a very, again, a very difficult question, um, but um, it, it really depends uh, a bit on how separate resistant and sensitive are uh, so meaning uh, if you have uh, the higher the MIC of the resistant uh, clones compared to the sensitive clones, the easier is, it is to usually to draw a conclusion as to what uh, gives uh, rise to the, to the high MIC. Uh, but in an ideal situation, a rule of thumb would be that you start with roughly 100 strains in each bucket. So 100 strains in the resistant uh, bucket and 100 strains in the uh, sensitive bucket. But sometimes it can go as high as 500 per bucket. And so you can, in the, and I would not uh, advise to go above uh, the sequencing of 1,000 strains. So, so basically, you have to sequence between 200 and 1,000 strains. So that's a it's a huge undertaking. And then pass through the data. Passing through the data, uh, there is a, a few uh, uh, bioinformatics solution that exists, such as DBGYS. Uh, but um, there is still um, these pipelines are still uh, being optimized. A related question. If you identify a gene by GWAS as being associated with resistance, how can you confirm it really does confirm resistance and is not a compensatory mutation allowing the resistant bacterium to grow? Again, very good, very good question. So, uh, if the genome-wide association study is performed correctly, usually you would uh, you would have you would see the compensatory mutation and the resistant mutation together. Uh, then, uh, by looking at the frequencies of these uh, these mutations, you can guess uh, what is going with what because you might also have two different compensatory mutation and two different uh, resistant mutation, and they work on in in pairs. So looking at the frequency uh, will uh, will allow you to make a to make a guess, but as often uh, you basically to to really answer the question you need to go back into uh, into uh, your favorite strain and then perform uh, the make the the mutants and then test directly the hypothesis. So just to clarify, you are suggesting you should clone the resistance gene or try and select a mutant in the test tube with a mutation in the same gene identified by GWAS? Clone, uh, clone the mutations in, uh, in an otherwise uh, wild type con context and confirm that the, the mutations uh, will, confer, will, uh, will bring you uh, the, the resistance. The uh, you could you could try so again because usually when you will do the GWAS you will see both you will see the compensatory and the resistance so it's a double cloning to test directly uh, the impact of a compensatory mutation you should introduce the compensatory mutation and then do the frequency of resistance to see if the second mutation appears it's a bit more complicated but that's also something you could or should do. Thank you. Please can you tell me if there is a go no-go level of spontaneous resistance above an achievable in vivo exposure that you can recommend? I'm not sure I understand the question. So a go no-go level for what? For the frequency of resistance, you mean? I think that's what the question is asking. Uh, so I think they're saying, is there a level by which you get spontaneous resistance and that will either su suggest that it, it's sufficiently rare that it is a go or sufficiently common that it should be a no-go. Okay. Uh, I don't know how to respond to that. I mean, if the frequency of resistance is, uh, you know, uh, typically in the magnitude of the inoculum size that you use in an animal experiment, uh, usually, I mean, you're, you're obviously Exposing yourself to, to trouble. Um, still, I would I think it's it's worth a try because uh, you might be surprised uh, at what ha happened in vivo. For sure, if you have something that is uh, in the 10 to minus 7 range, for instance, you definitely when you go in vivo, you definitely should do the double plating to see if 
you can see those resistant mutants appear in vivo. If the resistant uh, frequency of resistance uh, level is very, very low, uh, below 10 minus 9 or below 10 minus 10, then uh, the chances that you select that in vivo are remote because the inoculums are usually much smaller than that, of course. Uh, but I would still uh, uh, at least try uh, once or twice to do the double plating to s because in vivo the situation might be different. So there is no uh, hard, I, I'm not answering correctly to this question, but I would say 10 minus 7, definitely uh, you, you're exposing, you're being exposed to, to issues and you should look for resistance. And below 10 minus 10, you should not have any trouble, but you still should give it a try. Thank you. What is your view on using an in vivo grown inoculum for frequency of resistance studies? Um, that's all the question states, but I have a sort of follow up. I suspect that the person asking this question is saying, take an inoculum that has from bacteria out of an animal model and then do your frequency of resistance studies with that. Yeah. Um, I think I see where this is going. I mean, uh, basically, uh, maybe in vivo, the, there is a, an expression, a level of expression of different genes that will change the, um, how, how um, the susceptibility to resistance to your compound. Or you could select for, res for mutants uh, that are more fit in vivo that are also uh, will display different frequency of resistance. Um, so sh I would say, sh you know, sure, why not? Uh, you can, you can, you can try that. Uh, maybe uh, if you suspect so that something will happen uh, because of the difference in the growth uh, conditions, uh, you should directly test that. So basically, try to uh, instead of doing your experiments in MH2, maybe try in minimal medium, try in uh, in medium in the presence of serum, uh, which we often do. And usually that gives you, I would advocate to do these two experiments, do minimal medium and do MH2 plus serum, 50% serum. And if you, and you look if that has an impact on your frequency of resistance. We sometimes use also the phenotypic microarray to do the experiment. So the biolog, uh, biolog but that, and get, that gives you a much more comprehensive view on uh, the level of resistance, uh, depending on the metabolism, but that's a bit complicated to do. Thank you. Um, staying with this theme, um, people have done experiments with bacteria uh, from with a TN, a transposon library of bacteria to identify genes important in pathogenicity by putting the library through a mouse. Do you think that this will be a useful way of identifying in vivo rele relevant mutations? Yes, yeah, I'm convinced. I mean, the, the TN-seq experiment uh, I'm not sure I understand really the question, but the TNSeq experiment uh, can be used to to look for genes that are relevant in vivo, and we have we do the experiments. Uh, the only uh, issue there is that it's hard to uh, to put in a single animal enough uh, uh, bacteria to cover the the depth of the library. So you have to uh, resort to a model where you have you can have high inoculum and use uh, many animals that you pull in order to have a better view. So you have to avoid the bottleneck of the infection model. But if you can go above this bottleneck, uh, then you, uh, the TNSeq uh, uh, design can really give you an idea of what the mutants, uh, uh, what mutants will uh, have be important in vivo. And you could conceivably uh, also uh, challenge the library uh, in vivo with a compound. We've not done that experiment. Thank you. How can one do resistance experiments for non-traditional modalities or virulence targeting compounds? Uh, very difficult. <laughs> it's very difficult. Um, so in some modalities, so if the modality kills the bacteria and you can exert a, a, an easy selection pressure. So of, uh, one can think of phages and, uh, and uh, or uh, bactericidal um, uh, modality. Uh, then uh, it's, it's 
some usually relatively easy to transpose um, um, the, the setup that I've uh, described with this new modality. It's not always trivial, but sometimes because you can exert a killing pressure, it's, you can you can do that. If it's only a virulence compound, uh, uh, then it's it becomes uh, it becomes very very difficult. And usually you have the trick is to uh, use your compound that is targeting a virulence a factor and try to add something that will bring pressure. So for instance, uh, if you have a monoclonal antibody against uh, an antigen on the, on, the, on the surface of a bacterium, add, um, uh, add complement to, uh, to transform that into a serum bactericidal assay, for instance, or an antibiotic coupled to your MAB in order to have uh, toxicity uh, killing. Thank you. For novel compounds, such as lysins, which are 15 to 20 kilodaltons in size, the MIC using standard CLSI methods is usually high, such as in the range 64 to 128 micrograms per ml. So at an early screening stage, how do you interpret such data? Um, so the, the size, of course, of these, of these compounds is usually uh, what, what drive these, uh, these high MICs. So on a molar basis, then you, you're obviously in a much better, uh, much safer territory. Um, uh, still, it's, it becomes complicated to perform the resistance experiment that I've described when you go at multiple times the MIC. So in those cases, uh, I would advocate to uh, not not try to do the the frequency of resistant mutant uh, studies but uh, try to do the passage experiments because they are easier to to perform and uh, and will give you a, also a good level of information thank you why is there a difference in the mic value obtained using agar versus broth for different compounds which value should you use for resistance selection experiments? So the answer to the first question is I don't know. It's just something that we routinely observe. Uh, it might be due, um, again I don't know, but it might be due to the solubility of the compound that is, uh, could be different. Um, uh, but again I have no, no simple answer to, uh, to, 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 that, uh, to that question. Uh, which concentration you should use if you do the selection, uh, the spontaneous frequency of resistance uh, experiments. So since the selection is hap happening on agar plates, you should really uh, use the agar MIC. That's, that's your reference uh, value. Thank you. You mentioned that the frequency of resistances and serial passage resistance values for approved drugs are often bad. If this is the case, what is the value of doing these experiments for new compounds if we are not trying to outcompete the in vitro resistance profile of existing drugs? Uh, maybe I'm confused here. The, so uh, again, I stand by what I said. So usually when you do, uh, when you test even good good products such as uh, ciprofloxacin or, or colistin, it's uh, you 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 really you see the, uh, that uh, relatively quickly you can uh, you can select uh, multiple times uh, multiple fold increase in MIC over, over a short uh, number of passage. So your goal is to really be better than that, uh, and so to uh, to have the uh, shift in MIC that is as low as possible and takes as long as possible. So. Yeah, you should try to be better than uh, you use the comparator basically uh, uh, because it's very well known that some comparators have, uh, have um, uh, such as rifampicin for instance, you select very high level very quickly and some comparators uh, such as fluxacine uh, you know, and some uh, you it's it's kind of uh, you can go very high but it takes some time and some comparators it takes uh, it takes much longer to, to be high, so that gives you a, a bit of um, of an idea on how well you perform the test, and uh, and then your compound should be among the best comparator. Thank you. In one of your slides, you showed that the resistant bacteria had 
a high MIC, then the value decreased and then it increased again. Could you explain why that happened? Um, I th I'm not sure what the slide number is, but I, I suppose it's the MIC 90s uh, that was showing the distribution. If that's the case, it's just the distribution of the of the MICs, and so uh, unless I'm mistaken, that's what he was referring to. No, I'm afraid they didn't give the slide number. Oh. So, so I I cannot elaborate on that either. But thank you for the question, the answer, and I'm hoping that was the uh, question they were asking. Okay. So, uh, next question: Your presentation was about resistance to antibiotics, i.e., antibacterial drugs. Are the same approaches used to assess and understand resistance to antifungals? Or are there specificities to antifungals that need to be considered? So I'm not an expert in antifungals, but the uh, the, the basic uh, uh, spontaneous frequency of resistance uh, experiment is, uh, as far as I know, usually uh, done the same way for antifungals. For the for the others, uh, especially the more tricky one like uh, uh, transposon sequencing and things like that, I, I don't know. Sorry. Thank you. You mentioned in the discussion the spread of drug resistance. Do you know of any assay that can be used to assess uh, the spread of resistance? Yeah, uh, very, very good question here again. That's the, um, so the short answer is no. I don't know of any assay that is uh, routinely used, uh, used, uh, used for, for, for that. But here the question is, once you've selected a strain for resistance, can it transmit its, uh, the genetic determinants to a neighboring bacteria? Uh, so there is a traditional ways of performing uh, uh, trans, uh, <coughs> mating and uh, that you could, that, that could, you could try to use and see, uh, and see if just mixing the two bacteria in mating condition, so one sensitive and one resistant, if you can have the transfer. Obviously, in those situations, you need to mark uh, donor and receiver strains. You can do also similar experiment using uh, similar experiments uh, 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 with uh, different species in order to see what is the cost uh, to transfer across species. Frankly, I mean, uh, I, I, I understand what the what the the value and the interest, uh, but it's uh, it will be uh, yeah very difficult again to uh, to. Uh, translate uh, whatever results you might get uh, to, a, to a clinical situation. I've seen some experiments like that also performed in a, in a mouse gut. So that's, that's also something that can, can be done, but it's tricky. Thank you. So our last question is, um, based on the quinolones as an example, how stable and affordable is drug resistance, i.e. quinolone resistance, and how long would a worldwide moratorium in the use of quinolones need to be so that then the population of bacteria become uh, susceptible again? <laughs> that's, I'm glad that's the last question. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> it's a hard one. I guess they're yeah, asking, is resistance stable forever or will it yeah. revert? Yes. Um, uh, okay. Uh, so this is really uh, uh, population uh, biology and things like that, and um, and here there are so there are several things that uh, that one can say. First, it's it's interesting to 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 note uh, that it's very rare that um, uh, a mutant completely a resistant mutant completely displaces the entire uh, sensitive population. This is whereas you would intuitively think so. Um, uh, it's 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 not the case. So uh, MRSA is, uh, is obviously a big concern and went very high, but there was no MSSA has not disappeared, and uh, and we we know that uh, vancomycin resistance, uh, Staph aureus, is possible. But for whatever reason, uh, there are lots of reasons now, but uh, uh, vancomycin resistance has not been able to take over, and it's not for lack of using vancomycin uh, by far. Uh, 
so um, so it's 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 tricky to uh, to really uh, uh, make uh, guesses as to uh, how um, how far the resistance will go even if the pressure is maintained so in a similar way uh, when the pressure is uh, is decreased uh, it's difficult to uh, to guess uh, how quickly and how easily the the resistance population will uh, will disappear but the fact is that uh, there are numerous examples where it's it's shown that when you decrease the pressure the resistance actually decreases you can even uh, there, are, there are studies that have been performed in the general population where, for instance, there are even seasonal uh, reductions in the in the resistance level, based on the um, increase or decrease of uh, of uh, antibiotics usage. So it's very clear that uh, if you uh, if you stop using a, a compound, then the resistance usually usually decrease. How far and how long that is, how long will that last? That is a very 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 difficult uh, question to uh, to uh, to answer. Uh, a lot of clinicians are, are using that and it, it works, but uh, yeah, it's very difficult to, to answer. Thank you, Michael. So we have now come to the end of our question and answer session. Once more, I would like to thank you for an excellent webinar and very careful answering of some of those hard and complex questions. So thank you for contributing to our webinar series. Thank you very I much. would like to now take the opportunity to announce our next uh, webinars in February, one on 4th and 27th of February. On the 4th, Ursula Toritzbacher will talk about non-traditional antibacterial therapeutic options and challenges. This webinar will be moderated by the chair of the Guard P Scientific Advisory Committee, Prabha Fernandez, and I will also join Ursula for the Q&A session. On the 27th of February, we will welcome Alexander Lepak from the University of Wisconsin to give a presentation about PKPD murin infection models, focus on study elements, variability, and interpretation of results. This webinar will be moderated by Peter Warren from EvaTech, who has also spoken on one of our two webinars on animal models in the last year. You can register now for both February webinars on the Revive website. And we have a long series now of webinars uh, coming up both uh, in the coming months and going forward into 2021. So this is all from myself now and from the team supporting these webinars. Thank you all for joining today and for contributing to this discussion. As always, I hope you found this webinar interesting and useful and that you will join us again in the future. Please make sure to tell everyone you know about these webinars and encourage them to join too. Thank you and goodbye.